the Forty or Tea podcast. I think another thing that we haven't touched on is the, the stuff around cognitive empathy, because you know, Alexa Fymia is related to us, our, our emotional state, and ability to communicate our emotions and categorize them. Whereas cognitive empathy or indirect communication, be, being able to uh, look at someone, understand from the tonality, the body language changes, the facial expressions that they're in a certain emotional state. It's it's important. It's an important part of reacting yeah. to it appropriately um, with adaptive empathy. So it helps to understand how most people do this and then why it doesn't work for you and what you need to do instead, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. how most people do this is they start with the base assumption, the other person is just like me. Yeah. Which means yeah. if you're crying, it means you feel the same way as you do, as, as I do when I'm crying. Or it means if yeah. you are pacing around the room, it means that you feel the same way as I do when I'm pacing around the room. For most mm -hmm. autistic people, that is not a very good starting point. So we need to recognize that we probably need to check our own assumptions on that because it may mm -hmm. be quite different. And then once we recognize that, we can start to uh, link up how the person is actually feeling with how I actually feel at another time. Mm -hmm. So the base emotions are all the same. When you're sad, it feels the same as when I'm sad. Now, you might express it differently. Different things might make you sad, but I, we still know what that base emotion is like. Mm -hmm. So it's like we need to do one extra step with the cognitive empathy to recognize the emotion that the other person is communicating, link that to an emotion that I know what it feels like, and then link that to a situation that and an expression that I would use to express that emotion. And then that way I'm translating from, from their behavior to something completely different in my behavior that's essentially emotionally equivalent. And Making those, it, those cognitive a, links between yeah, the two. Right. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a uh, gymnastics, mental gymnastics, mm -hmm. but it, it is the way that we can make cognitive empathy uh, work really well. And then once you try it like that feels like, a lot of effort to go through but once yeah. you train it and you do it again 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 it becomes second nature mm -hmm. so that i can build up in my brain a database of how most people behave most of the time which means it's like learning a second language at the in the beginning you're learning all this grammar and you're learning all these vocab and you're like oh how am i going to remember all of these things but if you do it enough our brains you know, link up the patterns so that they're almost instantaneous. They go from our slow brain to our yep. fast brain. <laughs> and then suddenly we can do them all instantly uh, with the code switching that would otherwise have mm -hmm. taken us a long time. So the goal is not to keep doing those mental gymnastics. The goal is to train your fast brain to do it automatically so that it doesn't take you effort in the future. And there's a, there's yes, a big yeah. difference between those two objectives. I mean, I definitely sort of out in, out in the, the world, you know, with, with friends, coworkers, uh, you know, through, through podcasting and stuff, I think when I'm mentally quite, I have, I have quite, a, you know, my mental energy, I feel quite good. I think that those, those, the times where I'm, a lot better at picking up on emotional cues like that. I think that the, the issue for me particularly comes in when I'm feeling comfortable or that I'm around people that I'm around, around, around a lot. I kind of, I kind of shut my brain off a little bit. And I think some, sometimes I, I, you can get yourself into a bit of a situation where you get paranoid about, oh, are you are you thinking about this in the right way? Are you are you exaggerating how they might be feeling? Good day, viewers and listeners. Apologies for my very rude interruption to our regularly scheduled broadcast. I just want to remind you that if you have enjoyed the podcast thus far, please make sure to rate, subscribe, like, comment, and share. 
All of these actions are pretty much the lifeblood of a small independent creator like myself. And it will help me get most of my work, more of my work to people who really need it. If you want to stay up to date with my life, get behind the scenes content, check out my daily blogs, head over to the Instagram at Thomas Henley UK. You'll find a link to that down in the description alongside my range of neurodiversity clothing, just like this strong, powerful autistic hoodie that I love so much. And my website, of course, where you can find a contact email to book me for one-to-one -one autism coaching, interviews, workplace training, and speaking. So, thank you very much for listening to this very annoying self-advert, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Whew. And I, I think, you know, to a certain extent, that that's really sort of a useful way of sort of navigating the world from from our perspective. But I also think especially if you're in a relationship with um, a neurotypical individual, that they, they can do a lot of, of stuff themselves as well. Because, you know, there, there will be times where you don't pick up on the fact that their tone's just a little bit different than usual, you know, because pe people vary how they speak and, and how they, they look and feel on a daily basis. And it's not always connected to a certain emotion. So I, you know... I th I think it's it's kind of like meeting them halfway with it because I I think that something that really helps me feel a lot more confident that I understand the situation is if they they tell me mm. you know I say, I I pick up on something that's maybe a bit different I say are you okay mm. and instead of going yeah I'm good they'll say no I'm I'm not mm. I'm not good or they you know they'll, they'll say yeah I'm good. I'm like, are you, are you sure? Like, <laughs> that's a, that's actually a really fantastic, simple strategy mm -hmm. that I that I teach people in the, in my emotional intelligence course. It's around guessing and just noticing. Like, even if you don't know what the right answer is, you've noticed something is here. So you say, yeah, yeah. I noticed no something. Up. Is everything okay? And they'll say yes, and you'll say. Okay, because the reason I'm asking you is because it doesn't sound like you're okay. And <laughs> and then yeah. it might take one or two goes, but you'll eventually they'll eventually help you to figure out what was the thing you noticed. Because what you're noticing is there's a mismatch. Someone's saying yeah. they're okay, but they're sounding like they're not okay. And it's hard to figure out which one is correct, but that that's the hard part that mm. you that we want to get better at over time. Some people it can feel really like someone's lying to them as well. Mm. Like, you know, if you if you're very sort of hyper fixated on direct communication, exactly, and you yeah. don't really go with the indirect stuff. If someone says they're okay, you'd be like, cool, and you just get on with stuff. So it's like, the, and, so then, it's, and then if they say they're okay but they're not, and you're like, well, why the hell? Why the hell did you lie to me about it then? Like, so you get the, the issues around that. Yeah, so so even just mentioning it is a really good is a really good strategy. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But what I was going to say before, just very quickly, we'll probably have to wrap up. Sure, sure. Is that yeah? It's this kind of stuff works both ways as well. So in my coaching work, I work a lot with partners of autistic people, mm -hmm. and uh, a big part of that is helping them to train their brain to recognize when I come up to you and tell you in a calm voice that I'm at about 95% of my capacity and I'm going to need to go home pretty soon. Yes. They need to recognize that that means I'm actually at 95% of my capacity. I'm yeah, just down you, and you better do something really quickly and... because it's really <laughs> urgent and I know I'm not really expressing that through my emotions or words or speed of voice mm. or emotional tone or anything at the moment, but that's because I'm trying not to get tip myself over the edge so they can also help with that with bridging that gap as well mm. and there's there's obviously a lot of different sort of gaps and, and ways of bridging communication between autistic people and neurotypicals i think it's 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 also you know really important especially when it comes to mental health settings you know if, if some if someone has a a uh, patient, they're a psychologist, they're a mental health worker, 
and they're, they're autistic and the mental health worker doesn't really know much about autism and that person comes up and says i'm having the worst time i am just mm. completely depressed all of the time and the fact that they're not breaking down and sobbing and crying in front of them they don't really take it seriously and i think you know there can be lots of situations like that whether it's at school or in the workplace yeah. um you know, medical is a good example of people mm -hmm. being like sent home from hospital come back when it's worse like i wouldn't be in emergency <laughs> if it wasn't worse this is like 10 out of 10 what do we what do we yeah. do about it yeah yeah 